द विशिंग जग देर वॉज वंस अ पुअ बॉय कॉल्ड चोपिनी हु लिफ्ट विथ इज मादर एंड फादर इन अ लिटल चंबल डाउन कॉटेज इन द विलेज ऑफ ट्रीम ही वॉज अ लेजी फेलो एंड इंस्टेड ऑफ डूइंग हिज वर्क वेल ही वु ड्रीम ऑल द लॉन्ग ऑफ वॉट ही वु डू इफ ही वेर अ प्रिंस इंस्टेड ऑफ अ पेजेंट बॉय How fine to live in a castle and have many horses and men of my own he thought i should marry a princess and sit on a throne his work was carrying birds away from the fields he thought so much about what he would do if he were a prince that often the birds came and ate the crops under his very nose then his master would be very angry with him one day as he sat there twirling his rattle idly in his hands quite forgetting to shake it at the greedy birds he talked aloud to himself i should like to wear a red and gold cloak and hang a glittering sword by my side i should like a feathered cap and well and why shouldn't you said a voice behind him tupani looked around he saw behind him a tall thin man dressed in a cloak with suns moons and stars all over it on his head was a pointed hat and as soon as tupani saw him he knew that he was a wizard he jumped up and bowed have you come to ask me to do anything for you he said well said the wizard you might be able to help me out of a difficulty i have lost the key of my cottage on the hill and i very much want to get something out of it i believe you could just squeeze in through a little window that has been left open what will you give me if i do asked tupani you shall have the cloak cap and sword you were wishing for just now said the wizard ho oh, said tupani jumping up and down in delight lead the way wizard i will climb in through the window for you the wizard led tupani across many fields and at last came to a steep hill nestling in the side of it quite hidden by a clump of trees was a strange little cottage tupani had never seen it before indeed he never remembered seeing the hill either and puzzled his brains to think how it was that he had missed it they came up to the cottage and tupani saw that all the curtains were drawn tightly across the windows the gate was locked and they had to climb over it the wizard led the way to where a tiny window at the back had been left open it was high up and tupani wondered how he could reach it i will climb up this pear tree he said i think i can just swing myself down to the window sill if i climb along that branch he swung himself up into the tree and climbed along the branch towards the window then in a trice he was on the sill squeezing his body through the opening shall i open the front door for you he asked the wizard then you can come in and get what you want oh no don't bother to do that said the wizard all i want is a little red jug you will find in the kitchen in the middle of the table just bring me that there's a good lad tupani ran downstairs into the kitchen on the table was a little red jug with a curved handle he picked it up and then he heard a strange noise from outside he went to the window and looked out the wizard was fighting a fierce little gnome what are you doing near my cottage cried the gnome furiously you have come to steal something i know you have it's a good thing i locked all my doors take that and that and that shouted the gnome slapping the wizard hard the wizard suddenly cried out a strange word and the gnome disappeared and in his place there came a little winning dog that ran around and round the garden in despair tupini was frightened so this wasn't the wizard's cottage after all the wizard had sent him to steal the jug what a wicked man tupini was quite sure he wouldn't get the cloak and sword he had been promised and he began to be afraid 
that the angry wizard would turn him into something too. So he stole to the back door, slipped back the bolt that fastened it, and crept out. He ran to a thick bush and crouched underneath. Soon the wizard went to the window and called him. Hurry up, boy! he shouted. Can't you find the jug? When he heard no reply, he became angry and shouted more loudly. Suddenly, the little gnome dog ran up and bit him on the leg. The wizard gave a scream and fled away down the hill. The gnome dog ran after him and Tupuni was left alone under his bush, trembling. Soon he crept out and ran home as fast as his legs would carry him. When he got there, he found that he was carrying the little red jug. Oh, said Tupuni in fright, I have got the jug. Whatever shall I do with it? I daren't take it back. Where did you get it from? asked his mother and he told her. She took it and looked at it. Well, it's a pretty little jug, she said. If the gnome comes for it, he can have it. But I am not going to let you go back to that cottage with it. Let's use it, said Chupani, who thought it was the prettiest jug he had ever seen. We will keep the milk in it, mother. He poured the milk into it and put it on the shelf. When tea time came, his mother set it on the table with the other things. Tupini looked to see what there was for tea. Only dry bread, he said in dismay. Oh, mother, what a miserable tea. Just the same as breakfast and dinner. Well, times are very hard, said his mother with a sigh, pouring milk into the cups. I wish I had cakes, butter and jam to give you, Tupini, but... She stopped in surprise, for on the table there suddenly appeared a dish of jam, a dish of yellow butter, and two plates of wonderful cakes. Oh, cried Tupini in delight, look at that, mother, that's a wishing jug, sure, as eggs are eggs. He snatched it out of his mother's hand and wished again, pouring milk out as he did so, for he guessed that the little jug would not grant wishes unless something was poured out of it at the same time as the wish was wished. I wish for a cow of our own, a sheep and a pig, cried the excited boy. Moo, ba, grunt, came from behind him and there in the kitchen stood three animals he had wished for. His mother cried out in astonishment and drove them into the yard. Be careful what you wish for, you silly boy. She said, I don't want my little kitchen crowded out with farm animals. I wish for a big kitchen, cried Tupani. I wish for a big house. I wish for a garden and a farm and an orchard. In a twinkling, the kitchen became a great, big, shining room with an enormous stove at one end. The cottage disappeared and a grand house arose in its place. The tiny garden became spacious grounds and in the distant fields appeared dotted with sheep, horses and cows. A fine orchard came not far away, its trees laden with ripe fruit. My goodness, shouted Tupani in delight. We are rich, we are grand. I can be a prince and marry a princess. The jug was empty by this time, so Tupani filled it with water and began pouring it out, wishing all the time. I wish for a suit of red and gold, he said, and a feathered cap and flowing cloak. I want a glittering sword and a horse with nodding plums. I want a hundred servants to follow me, each carrying a sack of gold or jewels. Ha! I will be the grandest person in the land, and I will go tomorrow and ask for the hand of Princess Milani and marry her. As he wished, each wish came true. He was clad in red and gold, and a horse with nodding plums appeared in the garden. A hundred servants walked up the broad path, each carrying a blue sack, which Tapani guessed to be full of gold or jewels. Slip in the garden, he commanded them. With a wave of his hand, I shall not need you till tomorrow. The men obediently sank down on the grass and went to sleep. Tupani and his mother talked excitedly till his father came home and stared in wonder at the great house that stood in the place of his cottage. 
Tupani ran out and dragged him indoors, and the astonished man looked at the little red jug that had worked such wonders. The next day, Tupani set out to go to the palace of the king. He rode on his beautiful black horse, and a glittering sword hung by his side. His cloak of red and gold streamed out in the wind, and behind him walked his hundred servants with their sacks. At midday, he arrived at the palace gates, and the sentries opened them to let in this magnificent youth with his great following. Tell His Majesty that Prince Tupani of Trim has come to see him," said the bold youth. The king, hearing how grand the youth looked and what a number of servants he had, commanded him to be brought before him. "Your Majesty, I have come to ask for your daughter's hand," said Tupani, bowing low. The king laughed. "I know nothing of you," he said. "Where do you come from?" "From the great land of Trim," answered Tupani. I have brought some presents for you, sir. His hundred servants came forward and emptied their sacks in front of the throne. The king stared in amazement. He had never seen so much gold, nor so many glittering jewels before. This must be a very rich prince, he thought. The princess Melanie was sitting beside her father. She was a pretty maiden, and she liked the look. Of Tupani, he was much nicer looking than the old duke that her father had chosen for her to marry. She liked his merry black eyes and curly hair. I would like to marry this prince, she said. Tupani blushed with pleasure. The king bade his daughter be silent. My daughter is already promised in the marriage to the duke of Wetterbit, he said. He has a castle ready for her. And a necklace of lovely diamonds. I will build her ten palaces, each lovelier than the other," cried Tupani. "I will give her a hundred necklaces, a thousand brooches, and as many dresses as she pleases to have." "Nonsense," said the king. "No one is rich enough for that. If you could do so, as you say, I might give you my daughter. But such words are empty as air." Will you give me the princess Melanie to be my wife if I build her ten palaces tonight? Asked Tupani eagerly. Yes, said the king, laughing. I know quite well that such a thing can never be done. But listen, boy, if you fail, I shall clap you in prison for a year. That will teach you to boast idly. Tupani bowed and went out. He took the little red jug from the leather bag in which he carried it and filled it with water from a pump. Then he wished, "I wish that ten palaces, each more beautiful than the last, may appear before the king's eyes tomorrow morning," he said. "And I wish that a hundred pages shall appear before the princess Melanie carrying necklaces and brooches made of the most precious stones in the world." And that twenty maidens shall also appear, bringing with them dresses made of silks and satins embroidered with silver and gold. The next day, Tupani went to the palace very early and asked to be shown into the king's presence as soon as he was up. When the king at last received him, he bowed himself to the floor. "Your Majesty," he said, "I come to claim the princess." Melanie, I would marry her today. Nonsense," said the king sharply. "Don't be foolish. Where are these wonderful palaces you boasted of? Be off before I keep my word and clap you into prison, Your Majesty. Pray come to the window," said Tupani. The king went to the window and leaned out. At that very moment, the wonder happened. One by one. Ten gleaming palaces arose out of nothing and stood around the king's own palace, glittering in their beauty. Their towers and spires rising high in the sunlit air. Then, from each palace came ten pages carrying splendid necklaces and brooches on cushions of black velvet. Following them came the maidens with wonderful dresses for the delighted princess Melanie. Who flung her arms and Antipani 
and kissed him i shall marry you today she declared you are the most wonderful youth in the world oh father think of having 10 lovely palaces for my own and all those jewels precious well i hope that your husband will kindly plant the palaces a little farther off said the king they are very magnificent but they spoil my view stop hugging prince stupid melani and go and get ready for your marriage i suppose i must keep my word and give you to the prince what a to do there was that day the princess was married to tripani and all the people cheered madly when they saw the handsome pair driving through the streets in a carriage made of pure gold drawn by 20 coal black horses each with a white star in the middle of its forehead tripani had wished for this and the princess was simply delighted The next thing that Tupini did was to move the ten palaces a little further away, each on a hill which he had specially made for them. Then he and the princess Melanie stayed a week in each one, in turn, enjoying life very much indeed. Tupini gave Melanie the wishing jug for a wedding present, and at first she used it every day, finding it great fun to have all her wishes come true. no matter what they were then she grew tired of it and put it away in the china cupboard forgetting all about it for she had every single thing she wanted one day a beggar came to the kitchen door and begged for a glass of water get it yourself from the pump in the yard said the maid rudely lend me a jug to get it with said the man The maid opened the door for the china cupboard and looked for an old jug to give him. That red one will do, said the man, and the maid gave it to him. As soon as he had it in his hands, he gave a loud laugh and ran to the pump. It was a wizard. He filled the jug with water and began to wish. He wished the palaces to become cottages and all Tupni's lovely horses to become mice. He wished and wished and wished and Tupni couldn't think what was happening around him for everything began to change as the wizard wished At last Tupni rushed out to see what was the matter and there in the yard he saw the wizard who had sent him into the gnome's cottage to steal the red jug He saw the jug in the wizard's hand and rushed at him He snatched at it and the two began to wrestle for it There was still a little water in it and the wizard tried to pour it out and wish at the same time but tupini wouldn't let him give me the jug cried tupini hitting the wizard on the head oh shouted the wizard in pain all right you shall have the jug he managed to pour out little water and wished as he did so i wish you were away in a desert land he cried and much good may the wishing jug do you there in a trice tupini had disappeared he flew through the air and at last landed with a bump on yellow sand all around him stretched a desolate country here and there were low bushes and stunted trees but not a man or woman was to be seen well never mind i have got the wishing jug said tupini i will just wish myself home again and put everything right once more but alas the jug was empty it would not grant wishes unless something was poured out of it and tupini looked round for a stream or pond but in that desolate country there was none all that day and the next poor tupini wandered on and on looking for some water but could not find none i shall die of thirst he groaned if it were not for these fruits that grow on the bushes i should be dead already the sun is so hot that night Tupini lay down to sleep in despair. He knew there was no water to be found. But in the night he awoke suddenly. Something soft and wet was falling on his face. "It's raining," cried Tupini in joy. "It's raining. Where's my jug?" He stood out in the rain, but the shower was soon over and there were few drops in the jug. Tupini poured them out and wished quickly before the jug was empty wondering 
if the tiny amount of water was enough for a wish. I wish myself outside the pump at home, he cried. Yes, there was just enough water for a wish. For Tupini found himself flying through the air at a great pace and at last ended on his feet just beside the pump from which the wizard had filled the jug. Quickly, Tupini filled it full and wished loudly. Let everything be as it was two days ago, he said. And hey presto, the palaces came back with a rush. The mice became horses. The princess came rushing down the steps. And Tupini shouted aloud in delight. Everything was as it was before. This jug is too dangerous to be left about, said Tupini, after he had hugged his Melanie. If that wizard ever gets it again, we shall be in a bad way. Listen, darling Melanie, have you everything you want? Everything, said the princess. So have I, said Tupini. So I will smash the jug and no one can ever wish us ill. He threw the little red jug on the ground and it smashed into a hundred pieces. Each piece turned green, gave out a little spare of smoke and vanished. Ooh, said Princess Melanie. Did you see that? Tupini laughed. I want a drink of lemonade, he said. I am dreadfully thirsty. I will get you some, said Melanie. But Tupini, I am sorry you broke the jug. It would have been such fun to show it to our children and let them wish. We will get the story of it written down for everyone to read, said Tupini. I am sure they will like it and I hope you did. Next story, Bush's Secret. This is the story of a secret. It was Bushy Squirrel's secret and the secret was where he had hidden his nuts. He had hidden them in the hollow oak tree and covered them with leaves. He thought it was such a clever place to think of. Nobody will ever look there, he said. It's a secret, a secret, a secret. It's fun to have a secret. I won't tell anyone. What won't you tell anyone? Huxed, Cheetah chattered the magpie who came flying by and heard Bushy talking to himself. I shan't tell anyone my secret, said Bushy. Oh, do tell me, said Cheetah Chatter. I won't tell anyone. So Bushy told him. He whispered his secret in Cheetah Chatter's little ear. This is my secret, he said. I have hidden my nuts in the hollow oak tree. Isn't it a clever place? Very, said Cheetah Chatter and flew off again. Presently, Cheetah Chatter spied Bobtail pushing, frisking down below and he flew down to him. Good morning, Bobtail, he said. I have just seen Bushy Squirrel. He's got a secret and he told it to me. A secret? Oh, do tell me, begged Bobtail. I won't tell anyone. So Cheetah Chatter whispered the secret in Bobtail's soft ear. This is Bushy's secret, he said. He is hidden his nuts in the hollow oak tree. Isn't it a clever place? Very, said Bobtail, and scampered off. He soon saw Prickles the Hedgehog running along by a hedge, and he scampered up unto him. Good morning, Prickles, he said. I have just seen Chitter Chatter the Magpie. He knows a secret, and he told it to me. A secret? Oh, do tell me, begged Prickles. I won't tell anyone. So Bobtail Bunny whispered the secret in Prickle's spiky ear. This is the secret, he said. Someone, I won't tell who, has hidden his nuts in the hollow oak tree. Isn't it a clever place? Very, said Prickles and ran off. He soon met Frisky Squirrel, Bush's cousin, and he hurried up to him. Good morning, Frisky, he said. I have just seen Bobtail Bunny. He knows a secret. And he told it to me. A secret? Oh, do tell me, begged Frisky. I won't tell anyone. So Prickles the Hedgehog whispered the secret in Frisky's ear. This is the secret, he said. Someone has hidden his nuts in the hollow oak tree. Isn't it a clever place? Very, said Frisky and leaped away to the hollow oak tree. On his way, he met Bushy Squirrel. Good morning, Bushy, he said. I have just seen Prickles the Hedgehog. He knows a secret and he told it to me. A secret? 
How lovely! I have got a secret too, said Bushy. Do tell me the secret, you know. I won't tell anyone. So Frisky whispered the secret in Bushy's sharp ear. This is a secret, he said. Someone has hidden his nuts in the hollow oak tree. Isn't it a clever place? Come along and find them, Bushy. We will have a lovely feast. But that's my secret, wailed Bushy. It's my secret. They are my nuts. I thought no one would think of such a clever place. Oh, everybody knows, said Frisky in surprise. Prickles told me. I forgot who told Prickles. I'm going to ask him, said Bushy crossly and off he went. Who told you my secret, Prickles? He asked when he found him. Bobtail Bunny did, said Prickles. But I forgot who told him. Bushy went to find Bobtail Bunny. Who told you my secret, Bobtail? He asked. When he found him, Chitter Chatter the magpie did, said Bobtail. He said, you told him your secret, Bushy. So I did, so I did, said Bushy. And I wish I hadn't. Oh dear, dear me. I suppose I must go and hide my nuts somewhere else now. But when he looked for them, they were gone. That rascally squirrel Frisky had taken them. And all of because nobody could keep a secret, wept poor Bushy. Well, I will remember next time that the only way to keep a secret is to keep it yourself. The next story. The wrong lunch time. Mummy, may we go and play in the fields at the bottom of the garden today? Asked Anne. It's such a lovely day and we won't sit down on the damp grass. The little lambs are in the field and it's fun to watch them. Very well, said her mother. But you must come when I call you. I shall come to the kitchen door and call cuckoo loudly and you must cuckoo back and come straight in to lunch. Yes, we promise to do that said Gary. We won't be a minute late. Off they went. Gary took his box of toy soldiers and Anne took her favorite doll. I can put my toy soldiers out on the top of one of the hen houses in the field, said Gary. They will look fine all shining in the sun. And I shall take my doll for a walk all round the field and back, said Anne. I might find one or two Prime roses by the stream. If I do, Dolly can wear them in her hair. Gary put out all his soldiers one by one and marched them up in the hen house. They did look grand and took her doll round the field and found four prime roses. She was so pleased. She put two in her own hair and two in Dolly's. Come and see my soldiers, Anne, shouted Gary. They are all in a long line and ran over to look at them and just then a sound came to their ears. Cuckoo! Goodness! It's lunchtime already, said Anne in dismay. And we have hardly been here any time. Hurry up and put your soldiers away, Gary. You know what mummy said? We were to come at once? All right, said Gary and he scooped all his soldiers into the box. He put the lid on and the two children trotted back home. They went indoors and found their mother washing some cups at the sink. What are you back here for? She asked in surprise. I thought you went to play in the field. Well, you called us in, said Anne. We came at once. Bless us, child, I didn't call you, said her mother. It's only twelve o'clock. You have another hour till lunch time. But mom, we heard you call us, said Gary. Well, you heard wrong then, said their mother, wiping the cups dry. Go along now. I expect it was someone else you heard. Anne and Gary ran off again. This time Gary took his wooden train and Anne took her ball. Soon they were back in the field with the lambs again and Anne was throwing her ball up and catching it. The lambs came around to watch and when she missed the ball, so that it went bouncing towards them on the grass, they skipped off on their funny little legs, pretending to be quite frightened. Gary filled his wooden engine with stones and pretended that he was taking goods from place to place. Just as he was filling it for the third time, he stood up and listened. And he cried, time to go home, I heard mom calling. You didn't, 
said Anne. I did, said Gary. Didn't, said Anne. Well, listen then and see, said Gary. So they listened, and sure enough, Anne heard Kaku. Sorry, Gary, she said. You are right. It is mummy. But I didn't think it could possibly be one o'clock. Back home they went at top speed, and this time their mother was hanging out some clothes in the garden. Back again, she said in astonishment. What's brought you home again so soon? But you called us again, said Anne, in the greatest surprise. You did really. We both heard you. Darling, I didn't call you, said their mother. It's not quite half past twelve. Well, who could it be then calling us like that, said Gary puzzled. Let's go back to the fields and see if we can see anyone hiding, said Anne. Oh, Gary, it might be a fairy just playing us a trick, you know. They ran back to the field and hunted carefully all around the hedge. Then they heard the voice again. Kaku, there is someone hiding nearby, said Anne. I heard that call again and I am sure it's not mummy this time. Oh, do let's find whoever it is, Gary. But although they hunted everywhere, not a boy, nor a girl, nor a pixie could they see. Not one. It was disappointing. Kaku, Kaku, the children heard a voice in the distance and saw their mother waving to them. It is mummy this time, said Anne. Come on, Gary. They ran home for the third time, and it was their mother calling them. As they washed their hands, they told her how puzzled they were. As they were telling her, a voice called clearly, not far off, Kaku. Did you hear that? said Anne excitedly. Do you suppose it's a fairy having a joke? Their mother laughed till the tears ran down her face. My dears, she said, what silly billies you were. That's a Kaku. Come back again for the summer. He's been calling all morning. Did you really think it was me who was calling so often? The Kaku cried the children in delight and rushed to the door at once. Sure enough it was, they heard his clear call coming down the hillside. Kaku, 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 the children shouted back. You tricked us this morning, Kaku, and made us go home twice for nothing. But we are very glad you are back again. Kaku, shouted the Kaku, and they heard him all the time they were having lunch. He was just as glad to be back as they were glad to have him.